welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time, we created some ghosts and a world for Questlandia 2. This episode, we're going to discuss the character creation process. We are excited to welcome back Evan Rowland and Hannah Schaefer, the designers of this game. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves for everybody and tell us a little bit about the character you made in our last episode? And maybe if you want to give like one fact about the world. Yeah, I am Hannah, one of the designers of Questlandia 2. And I made a ghost who was the mischief maker archetype. They were uh, large and scruffy um, and like a round ball of fur. Um, and they liked uh, happily getting into trouble. And one fact about the world is that we made people. We were a society of people who made people. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Totally normal. Yeah. yeah. Totally normal. <laughs> I mean, pretty normal. Uh, I'm Evan. I'm another one of the designers of Questlandia 2. In the game that we played, I was a talking snake who was interested in nature and uh, the plant life of the world. In that world... I discussed the trees whose wood is the material that makes a new life, the automatons that the people of this world made, uh, who are very professional and increasingly anarchistic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Awesome. And Amelia, why don't you tell us about your character? Sure. And a, a, and a fact about the world. Okay. Um, I picked the investigator archetype, um, and so my ghost was upright and dapper, um, and dangerously curious. Um, there is, um, we decided a scarcity of this wood that is used to make our new people, um, and some very complicated environmental factors around, uh, why we can't just grow more of it. Mm Mm-hmm. And Ryan, what about you? I was making uh, the builder ghost, uh, who was constructed from many pieces, but full of enthusiasm. And um, <laughs> a character <laughs> designed literally for you. I know. I'm so <laughs> happy. So great, you and so great. <laughs> so happy about that. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, Apparently, there was a uh, a movement to to halt the creation of these creations so that the world could uh, balance itself out again, which uh, which is very sad or hopeful. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> I guess we didn't stay long <laughs> enough to find out. No. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and then and, and uh, dive right into our segment that we're going to be calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts. So in this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it relates to this system and to other games. Uh, but first, the classic interview question. How did you get into role-playing games? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> do you want to begin, Hannah, or should I? Uh, you should do it. Um... I had a cool uncle who sent me first edition D&D junk in the mail when I was a kid, Ooh. Uh, including his old characters, his his elf, Gordon Lightfoot, who <laughs> <laughs> I learned much later <laughs> it's based on an actual person. Um, um, so I was very young. I have memories of being in elementary school, walking to school with my friend, uh, talking about our D&D campaign, and accepting an actual bribe of his lunch money to give his character some advantages. So it's from that immoral foundation that my career has grown. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> That's just called metagaming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why we have such a metagamey game, huh? <laughs> uh... <laughs> what about you, Hannah? How did you how did you end up here? <laughs> yeah, good question. I I didn't get into role playing games until much later, although I'm a lifelong like player of games. 
Uh, I played a lot of video games as a kid. Loved some Sim Park. Loved some Loom. Really appreciate a point-and-click adventure game. Um, But yet, it wasn't until uh, Evan and I had started this community center going on... It was not quite 10 years ago, but... uh, an amount of time has passed uh, that, you know, a bunch of game designers walked through the door and uh, it was like, oh, cool. Maybe I can make pen and paper games. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I guess is how that, I mean, that is so my my, uh, my like birth as a game designer and as a player like kind of happened simultaneously. That's awesome. Did that did you then just kind of as you were introduced to game design, then did you decide like, oh, I need to play a bunch of games to kind of get a feel for it? Or is it just like a thing that you're like, oh, I want to design games. And then being in that space led to playing more games. Honestly, the first few role-playing games I played, I think I struggled with a little bit. Um, There were like some parts of the process that I found a little difficult. And so the jump to like wanting to make my own and to see if I could do it myself was, well, within like the course of a few months. Wow. Yeah, I think that's, I think that happens for a lot of people is like you sit down and right away you're like, oh, this thing doesn't work. Yeah. And then, house rules, you know, you start with like house yeah. rules <laughs> and things like that. And, you know, um, we, I brought it up. I don't know if it was in on this podcast or not, but um, in our first Character Evolution cast episode, when we talked to James D'Amato, he said, every time you sit down to play a game, you are designing. He's like, you make a decision on what rules you're going to keep and which ones you're not going to use. And so every time you sit down to do something, that is game design. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for a lot of people, that's how it starts is like, well, this thing isn't clicking for me. It's not working. So either we're just not going to do that or, but what else instead? Or how can I fix it? And Mm -hmm. then it kind of just, like I said before, it just snowballs from there. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, even on our our first series, uh, D&D, Talsquall pointed out that there's three different ways to create characters in D&D. Three different ways to roll your attributes or pick your attributes. Choosing which way, that's a design process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is really interesting. Yeah. You're making design decisions all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just whether you, you know, write them down or not. Ryan and I have expressed our love of collaborative world building a bunch of times on this show um, to the point where we recently just did an episode that was just about collaborative world building. Um, <laughs> but I'm interested in to, I'm interested to know what about it appeals to both of you, because this is a game that's very heavily involves that world building portion. I mean, make big things like as a company, we're a co-op. So a lot of what we do is like making decisions together and making collaborative decisions together. And I think that also some of uh, at least what we were really trying to do in Questlandia 1 was to recognize some of like the limitations of a lot of collaborative games we played. Um, You know, my experience with some collaborative games had been like that it was really easy to get talked over as a quieter player that like the collaboration turned into sort of a snowball of excitement. And like, if you got, uh, it would be easy to get left behind. So making Questlandia one was us trying to take the parts of collaboration we loved the most and try to like codify some of the, uh, good behaviors. That sounds so boring and like (laughs) strict (laughs) (laughs) trying to make just like suggestions for really how to make that collaboration work because some games are kind of like now collaborate. Um, and it's, it's what we're trying to do in Questlandia too. Uh, also, although it's, you know, it's got a long ways to go. (laughs) I don't want to be too hard on it because you know, it's still, it's still a baby game, but, uh, Evan, do you have any, anything you want to add? When we were first testing out Questlandia 1, I remember being shocked at how much I fell in love with the worlds that we were making at the table. And that shock was partly because I had this idea of world building as being the burden that is on a fiction creator. It's like, oh, Tolkien is a big achievement was creating this big world. 
that then he can introduce us to. Mm -hmm. Um, As opposed to thinking, first of all, that that is achievable. It is not a absolutely titanic, mysterious process to make an enormous world that's interesting and new and worth exploring. And second, that it's not work, that it's thrilling. It's really fun to make your own world. That when a mm-hmm. setting comes with its own pre-built world, uh, that was the author having their own bit of fun before letting you in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by starting the game with creating the world altogether, not only can you enjoy the process of doing that sort of archaeology and g- growing your understanding of the setting, you also have the chance for everybody to put a hook into it so that it reflects something they care about. Like maybe some people at this table care about climate change or uh, discrimination or, you know, the politics of how people get into society and what roles they take. Because those are some of the themes that just sort of naturally arose through our conversations about the world that we made. And I think that makes Mm -hmm. a world that everybody feels invested in. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So is that is that part of the reason then why you made it a GMless game, so everybody was on the same level in that collaborative world building process? Definitely, I mean, the GM part of the GM's job is to make a setting that everybody can be engaged in, right? And like your your job is to make sure that all the players at your table have a way that they feel invested in the world and excited to be a part of it and have things to do that reflect what their character is sort of pointed at. You know, a good GM will be supporting their player group like that. Um, in Questlandia, we want everybody to be doing that for each other all the time and everybody to feel that same kind of connection to the setting like if we did have a gm and we was i was still asking you to make a part of the world you might not feel the same responsibility to make that part of the world uh relevant to everybody in the group connected to everything that everybody else is making because it could just be off put onto the gm it's their job to bring it all together to make the story out of it this game focuses a lot on player input in creating the story um but it still does use dice or in this case a die um and previous your um the original questlandia used playing cards too uh why did you feel like adding that element of randomness was really important to the process i mean i feel like even from what we just played you know the for me, even though I love the world building, it takes a lot of like creative energy. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Like it can be both fun and exhausting at the same time. And I feel like also when it's collaborative, there's like this emotional component of like, is this idea okay? Is somebody not gelling with this idea, but they're like not comfortable saying it? Um, and so adding randomizers both takes away it feels like it takes away a little bit of that like social stress and also creative stress um and it just like uh you can often come up with things that are so much more creative with like a little bit of that limitation i mean the difference between like rolling for an eye and picking iris and having nothing to roll on and being like what should the name be of the kingdom we start in Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) especially when you're playing you know you're just in the very beginning of a game maybe with strangers like that that i ends up being really crucial Mm -hmm. yeah i I find that gaming like for me always works better and i say this about like pretty much any system is when i have at least a little bit of a structure to work within like i need somebody to build some of that scaffolding for me because otherwise it's it's just too overwhelming to be like i don't know you can do anything Mm -hmm. yeah okay um so having some of that like okay you can do anything within this sort of area cool great yeah i can work with that Mm -hmm. and it's really interesting in 
in my experience with what we did the last uh, episodes, that element of randomness kind of is indicative of your ghosts, your characters aren't omnipotent Mm -hmm. in this world. They're not like, they're not the masters of, uh, you know, creating every single thing from themselves. They have this thing saying, oh, by the way, we're introducing this trouble. We don't know what type of trouble it's going to be. Once we figure that out, then we can shape it a little bit. Yeah. Which is really cool. Yeah. It's been a, an ongoing question about like how how much the ghosts are creating the world, impacting the world, uh, observing the world. And I, I don't mm-hmm. think we've like settled exactly on an answer yet, but I... I definitely don't want them to be like gods, you know, right. like, oh, yeah. we're pulling the strings of these little people, marionettes, even though we did create a world where we literally <laughs> made people, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So what does the process of character creation then tell us about playing the game? I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting one because... Well, the process there, of character creation was just like, there's like nothing. three, <laughs> yeah, three was, things, right? So yeah. like that doesn't tell us a ton, but then like what we went through after that to do like the world building was... I, I, I don't know. I think it does tell us a ton. Like the silence is, is deafening in this case where it's saying, you know, you don't know much about yourself as this ghost going into this thing, whereas oh, we don't true. know anything about the world going into it aside from the name of what we call it effectively i like that we just answered that question like we have like an interview podcast. i think you yeah. <laughs> Here's, let me tell you about your Why game don't you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> this game's just got my mind going though yeah i love it Evan, I don't know. Is there anything that you want to add, or I mean, or is it sort of an answered question? I mean, for me, it's not an answered question. This is a part of the game that's being very actively developed. You saw the touchstones of the characters, which are an idea of learning about the backstory of your characters as mm-hmm. a result of them learning about the story of the worlds that they're in. So the character creation process is definitely ongoing over the course of multiple worlds in that case Mm -hmm. Um, and is linked to your understanding of the places you visited. And that's just talking about the ghosts as characters, but we met one character and could have met many more within the world. We met Camden, one of the created people of this world. And the process of creating Camden starts with one person's idea And then is fleshed out by everybody at the table asking more or less, what are they interested in about this character? And in that way, Camden is a shared character that has something about him or them, sorry, that reflects everybody's interest at the table. And that's interesting. It it almost feels like, um, like the backstory of the ghosts is not supposed to be fully revealed in one world. For sure, yeah. What what happens when you fulfill all your touchstones on a ghost, then? Is that still in, That's a forbidden in question. the design phase? Uh, I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to answer that. <laughs> oh. ask us in six months maybe we'll know yeah. the answer <laughs> that's really interesting well i went so i wanted to ask then why um obviously the goal is to kind of figure out like the background and the story of your ghost um but we really only have like those two questions when we kind of create them was that really important to only have like that minimal amount of information about the characters or is that just like a matter of not knowing quite yet like what other things might be important or some of that is that uh, 
there's been this thing that we've been wrestling with since we first came up with the idea for these ghosts, uh, which is like how, if you're going to be creating these ghost characters and then creating these worlds where inside the world there will be characters, like how much is going to be character and world information overload? Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is sort of like still in the experimental phase, but the idea of like limiting the information that you learn about your ghost at first is um, partly to limit that overload and then making them ghosts just really justifies that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's like you just tie those mechanics uh, into the narrative. Sometimes if you feel too invested in that meta level, uh, it makes it more difficult and redundant to make characters in the world you know i was the gardener Mm. and if you feel like every character that you're going to introduce in this setting needs to be a gardener (laughs) or like Mm -hmm. you know a a sower uh it gets too restrictive and it's too limiting and it's not really the intention the hope is that It gives you certain angles to approach the setting at, but without feeling like uh, you're going to be a one-trick pony for an entire campaign, constantly just talking about grass. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I did did notice that it was... um, We were all collaborating to different aspects of the society, and I think... um, If we were to get into those scenes, we would have been able to see more uh, distinct aspects of our own characters, of the ghosts, of the specialties that we had. Yeah. Um, But since since we stayed away from the scenes for the sake of time, um, and so we didn't have to role play out a bunch of actual role play and actual game. We don't do that here. Yeah, we don't don't do that here. (laughs) We don't play games. We just talk about them. (laughs) Um, since we, since we avoided that, it was, it was more abstract and more generalized, uh, in terms of what we were creating with the world. And, uh, something that, uh, I think Hannah had said before, or maybe it was Evan, um, the, I, I love that the, the process of diving in, not knowing much about your character and learning about your character through learning about the world is is really really interesting because you're you're diving into this campaign of unknowns to try to self-discover which is really cool yeah i feel like you started out with like just tons of hooks and like tons of direction that you can go in and that was without even like going further into the actual like archetypes and the kind of questions and scenes and things that we had on there that then would like sort of further pull on those strings like i feel like we started with a really solid base before we even got into it that's great to hear yeah (laughs) good feedback (laughs) i mean i i'm so like obviously this is a a gm-less game but this is a thing that interests me a lot of times about character creation is the way that we make choices there and what that can tell a GM about like the kind of game that you want to play. And so like the world building and those character choices are really important because they do influence what happens going forward. And I think it's all the more important in a game like this where there isn't a GM and you're Mm -hmm. sort of like running it yourself. But even in those games that do have someone, it's, you're not just like showing up with a character sheet and then like, I guess we'll see what happens. It's like by building that character, you've sort of said, these are the things that are important to me. These are the questions that I want to explore. These are the themes that I care about. And then like translating that onto a game. And I feel like this game, from what I can tell, um, does a really good job of that and is all the more important because you're having to do that yourself. You know, because there isn't somebody running things or picking, Mm -hmm. like, where the story is going to go. You're all doing that together. Yeah. Yeah, we tried to make a lot of those uh, decisions just very explicit. Where the touchstone of a character, like the investigator has a touchstone, which is somebody is murdered in the setting. And we need to find Mm -hmm. out why. And 
that would be you just saying really explicitly, I want there to be a murder mystery in this world that we're going to solve. <laughs> right. And I want everybody else at the table to weigh in about what would make that interesting and difficult. Mm -hmm. So it tries to give everybody the tools to be very clear about what they're asking for from the game and to have the tools to deliver it to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say the only quote unquote flaw um, of this type of approach is kind of the point of the game really so it's not really a flaw in the, in the game design itself it's a flaw in the um you don't know much up front if if anything aside from i'm going to be the builder and this is what i look like and this is how i act mm -hmm. right and you you have to kind of invest yourself into that like super meta level and want to dive into a different plane as different NPCs within this world. It, it's not a real flaw. It's just a, a different way to play because you're not coming to a table with a fully fleshed out character. Well, so we didn't ask this question yet, Ryan. Oh, <laughs> I apologize. Just jumping ahead. So one of the things we, we like to talk with people about is like, what are the flaws? What are the things that you are proudest of? Um, and I will say that's a thing, Ryan, that comes up a lot when we when we re talk about these like flaws and generally where we end up is it's only a flaw if that's not the kind of game you want to play. Yes. Um, and it's like you have to be invested in that thing going into it. So you have to be playing with a group of people who are like, we want to tell a story and we want to be like here and present in the moment and be part of this story because like it's not going to happen to you there is nobody to make sure that this game happens to you you know mm -hmm. yeah and so like i guess if that's you know if you want to show up and just kind of like casually like hang out this maybe isn't like you know like if you want to be on your phone and also like playing this game it's like <laughs> not gonna work out for you. but then maybe this just isn't the game for you that's not a flaw in the game mm -hmm. so much as you know, like not everything is for everyone, right? Yeah. But I want to ask you two, because you've been like looking at this game so much and like changing so many things. Are there things right now that you feel like this is a thing that I definitely know needs to get fixed? Or is there a thing that you generally feel this is a thing that like we're going to keep this works really well? I mean, definitely as we were playing, there were little things where I was like, oh, I want to tweak this or limit this or shift this. Um, I was also like, whoa, we pulled this together really fast and it worked pretty well <laughs> <laughs> for this version because <laughs> we pulled together so many versions um, over the past year. And um, it coming up with this idea for the these, these characters that are ghosts were formerly called the junk poets um, and... It's, it's just been this ongoing question of like, who are the drunk poets? How do they work? Are they going to break the game? And making them these ghosts has really helped things come together. Uh, it's like a story that sort of justifies itself. Um, yeah, flaws. I mean, definitely the, like this process is not going to be for everyone. Um, and it also, it's been like a hard game to figure out how to pitch it and like what to, since Questlandia 1, we've sort of struggled with just like, the, you know, the, the pitch, like what's the elevator pitch? How do you explain this game? Because that's going to go a long way into telling people like, there is no world when you sit down at the table. So we have to be able to communicate it through the themes and like really try to reach the right people for like, well, you know, here's what we care about. Uh here's the stories this game aims to tell, but it is not telling them yet. <laughs> That's what you're here for. You're going to make it. It's a game of self-discovery through external discovery. Exactly. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Save like, that. Clip that out. Someone write that down. Right, right, we're writing it down. We're writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> One very um, just sort of surface level challenge that I hope doesn't turn into a flaw in the final version is arranging the information on these sheets for the ghosts because that sheet is 
both a character sheet of how to play this character and advance them and what tools you have. It's also a GM book. It tells you how to run scenes, how to organize the other players, what questions to ask of them and how to answer them. It's, uh, it's a lot. It's a very involved piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those components of it are linked together. The kinds of scenes that you can call for have something to do with what kind of character you want to play this ghost as. And so designing this page so that you can quickly find the thing that you're looking for, have a good sense of what you want to do, maintain a sense of your character and not just your role as like an organizer of the world. It's tricky. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's like a, um, a thing that comes up a lot is just how to, how to communicate what you need to communicate, like how to tell people all of the things that they need to know in a way that is accessible and understandable. Right. Um, so you don't have to look really hard to find the things that you need. Um, but it's not like so simple that you don't have the info that you need. Like, that mm -hmm. seems like a very delicate balance that I think a lot of, I, and like, honestly, in, in my expert opinion, <laughs> um, that a lot of like, even like big game companies struggle with, like that there are, you know, like the way that the books are laid out or where the info is or, you know, even how to find things on your character sheet or how to read a character sheet. Mm -hmm. Like it's very complicated and um, it's, like I said, a very delicate balance to strike and one that I'm not sure that there is like a perfect answer for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, design is so much, uh, is such a big part of the understanding of how to play a game. Like visual mm -hmm. design and layout. Um, not just the game design, but like the, you know, the layout design, because you can actually like you can squeeze a lot onto a character sheet. But if it's not laid out in the right way, uh, that flow of information just becomes really overwhelming. So that's definitely going to be one of our challenges. I think that's a thing, too, that is. Um, it's difficult to do on your own as a designer too because like the way that you look at the sheet is also colored by the fact that you know all of these other things about the game whereas I know nothing about this game so when I sit down and look at the sheet is that enough to tell me what I need to know and so that's mm -hmm. a thing that you have to kind of um collaborate with or and that's you know like playtesting and feedback and things like that too of balancing like you know, what do I feel like you need to know versus what do I feel like I need to know? Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Sure. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's complicated. I know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that sure is a sure of like, oh, sure, sometime we're going to have to send this out to other people and, you know, like not be there at the table and get that next round of feedback. Uh, oh, yeah. Where you thought something made sense visually that totally didn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how have you changed the system from Questlandia 1 to Questlandia 2 to tell these different stories, aside from making it into a long-form campaign sort of deal? Um, Something that I feel like we're still working on in terms of not just changing the game, but changing the types of stories, is that Questlandia 1, it was this game about collapsing kingdoms, and the game didn't really tell you, like, sometimes you could make these choices, basically, with the dice to um, get something good for yourself in exchange for throwing your kingdom or your world under the bus. And Ooh. so for a certain type of player group or, like, a player who was like, I love the Joker. I you know, some men just want to watch the world burn. Um, <laughs> like you would get these worlds that sort of descended into like a jolly type of chaos and oh. making the game now in the political climate that we're in where it feels like that type of chaos and like being joyful about that type of cast just feels like a little too on the nose for us right now. 
uh, we wanted to change the game to make sure that it told stories of people, you know, maybe confronting a difficult time and like coming together in that time and people who aren't necessarily like they're not heroes, they're not necessarily good people, but that, that it didn't like delight in that type of uh, like it's chaos and it's all on fire and that's you know that's funny <laughs> it it felt like you know the 2014 version to the 2019 version had to get a little bit of a kindness upgrade <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know evan is there anything that you want to add i mean i think that's that's right on yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just we felt a little sad and we were like, oh, we want to tell stories of people coming together and, you know, mm -hmm. trying to not necessarily fix their world, but not hurt it. It makes sense. I'm wondering how much that kind of thinking has influenced some of your other game design, too, because it seems like both of these versions of this game have been fairly influenced by um you know like the world around you and the political climate and things like that and i'm wondering like is that something that has always sort of fed into your design work or your creative projects or is that something that has like you've used this as a project to kind of channel some of that you want to take that evan i think you know some of both Every project has some real world inspiration. Um, when I was working on Noirlandia, which is about principled people in a corrupt society, uh, I wasn't thinking like, this is a corrupt society and these are going to be people who shake it up. But uh, it involved watching a lot of noir, uh, thinking about isolated acts of crime or you know problems in society versus systemic issues and how to mechanize that and the most sort of fruitful and interesting questions that go into designing any of these games feel like they have to hook into an actual concern about the world that i have uh or a question about the world that I have, if for no other reason than game design takes lots and lots and lots of hours and to stay interested in it throughout that time, there's got to be a heart of care and interest and curiosity so that you can be learning something as you go. Yeah, that's not a thing that I've... I say, like, I keep saying this, like, I've, like done so much game design like it's like a little bit of one game um we'll get there <laughs> when i have buckets of free time um <laughs> but that's the thing that like i don't know that i've really spent a lot of time like personally analyzing like why i've made those decisions so it's it's interesting because i feel like you've both been very like transparent that this is you know like this is a thing that is influenced by what's going on around you and i don't know if i've like really analyzed that Ryan, have you? <laughs> I mean, it also depends on the kind of game you're making, too. Like, mm -hmm. how much that influences. Like, it, I think in my case, at least, it's not so much about, like, my political views or the world around me sort of affecting what's happening in mm -hmm. the game or, like, how the game is played so much as th it's the reason why I need to be making something. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is this is my outlet for, like, this frustration or these feelings of, like you know, in my case of like this need to be productive or create something. It's like I have to yeah. be doing something mm -hmm. tangible with my time. <laughs> um, and that's where mine comes from. But it's, I don't know, it's just interesting. Yeah, I, I just wanted to create a game where um, you create any sort of world you want to play in and then you play as heroes in that world. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of uh, where, where Chimera kind of started from, where you can blend any number of these genres, but you are the hero of the story of that world, which uh, which was very compelling to me. Whether or not that had anything to do with society or just uh, me as a, a t early teenager saying, I want to be a knight when I grow up. Yeah. I want, I, That's a part I of society. Like that, that's you yeah. figuring out your role. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, and I feel like that does fit you, Ryan. That was like, you're the kind of person who like, Ryan always plays the healer. No, <laughs> no, but you are the kind of person who's like, I'm going to fix the problems and I'm going to like be this like, you know, like this force for good always. Oh. Like, you know, um, you're not, you're not quite as jaded as I am. Be, yet. be the change you want to see in the world. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I don't know. That was just, I, I know not again, not on our outline, but intriguing to me. <laughs> Um, this is the fun part of the podcast. Uh, not that the rest was terrible, but, um, <laughs> this is, this is what I like to call the fan fiction section of the podcast, where we talk about how we think this game might have gone if we had actually played it. Um, a lot of times we talk about, like, how the mechanics of the different character types go together. I don't think that that's as relevant in this case. Um, I mean, cause there are, like, questions and things like that, but, um generally i just want to know like what do we think would happen i was i think as the investigator ar- archetype like i need to know who set this fire <laughs> yeah. i think that's yeah. pretty important i mean one mm-hmm. thing that i am looking forward to in this game and we haven't had a chance to play test it yet is the conversations and conflicts that the ghosts will have with each other um mm-hmm. I would really look forward to talking to the builder ghost who is maybe fascinated with the actual art of constructing these and being the snake who's just like, you're not building anything without the trees. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Um, I would, I'm, well, I would be excited to see how those conversations went. Absolutely. Yeah, that's an interesting thing, too, because I, we don't really know much about ourselves as characters. You know, there's, I wonder how, like, role-playing that would go, um, because there isn't a whole lot of, like, I don't think that we have a whole lot to go on there, which isn't a bad thing. I'm just, like, interested in, I think when we, other times when we build characters, it's like, oh, okay, I have a general idea of, like, my personality and Ryan's personality and, like, how that would interact and we don't have as much of that here so i'd be really interested just to see like what what that looks like as opposed to yeah i think you're right just like our interactions with the world Mm -hmm. but with each other too would be Mm -hmm. fascinating yeah because i have no clue where that would go the dream is for that to be something that can grow and evolve over the course of a whole campaign we've been to multiple Mm -hmm. worlds together and we're feeling more and more at home with our ghost characters and mm-hmm. our relationships to each other. Uh, and in a certain sense, the focus starts to shift more to the ghosts and why they're here and what they want out of these worlds uh, over time. Mm-hmm. But it's just a hope. That's my fan fiction for my own game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I really like that, though, because I think that's a problem. I I don't particularly like to play one shots because I feel like I don't have enough time to figure out who my character is. Mm -hmm. It, I just always like walk away and I'm like, that was a fun game, but like, I don't feel like I got like the level of immersion that I wanted because Mm -hmm. it, I just didn't have time to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so it's a thing that I prefer about campaigns. And I, I kind of like the idea that I don't have to know any of that right away. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I feel like that first session is always really awkward for me trying to like figure out, exactly how to inhabit a character and it feels like this game would let you kind of slowly figure that out over time which is a thing in my personal experience that i'm doing anyway yeah it's interesting because when when you have talked in the past amelia about prepping for long form campaigns where you know this is the character i'm going to be playing for x number of months um you prep the heck out of that character (laughs) right you've got yeah. you've got a lot of good like backstory so when when uh when you know the first session starts you know a lot about what that character is mm-hmm. this kind of takes away a lot of that pre-game pressure yeah yeah i think that that's that's true because i i I have weird feelings always about, like, backstories and, like, you know, like, coming in with, like, a ton of information, A, because I don't feel like that's a thing that you should put on your GM. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't have to read my 300-page novel before we can sit down to play. (laughs) Um, And I also have, like, complicated feelings about getting too attached to something that hasn't actually 
happened at the table. Mm -hmm. You know, like having this idea of like, this is who my character is. And then getting into the game and that doesn't quite fit. And like, how do you, you know, resolve that dissonance? Mm -hmm. Um, But I do like to go into a game and kind of have an idea of like, what is the kind of arc that I want for my character? Like, what is their central, like, personal conflict? And, like, you know, like, what would a potential, like, story arc that you want to play out? Mm -hmm. Um, Which is a thing that this game sort of has you do in the moment rather than me spending three months being like, I don't know who they are as a person (laughs) and, like, what they want out of life. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't know, but like we'll figure it out. Yeah, um, it almost which feels... is an interesting way to play a campaign. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I would really, really love it or be like, mm, I don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like to. I just like to know things. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's all about uh, every character has the goal of self discovery. It mm-hmm. feels and and with that in mind, the more we uncover of ourselves, the more you know questions we have of what is left to uncover. And going down that that sort of rabbit hole in care in, in play is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and watching everybody do that at the same time would be so cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, part of my fan fiction is seeing the investigator, the dapper, curious investigator, finally uncover a plot to burn down the museum find out who's culpable and then it turning around to this situation where we all learn and remember together how we first met this ghost and what it was like when you joined the concord and like think about the whole arc of your first moment of meeting us all to this moment of discovery within this world and just to having the relationships deepen in two directions at once, just at that mm-hmm. moment. Oh, I didn't even yeah. think of that. That's awesome. Oh, that's very good. Yeah. That's very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm intrigued by, like, that idea, too, of, like, collectively deciding that backstory, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I think... That's a thing that I, I like about doing, like, character creation as a group um, and why Ryan and I are obsessed with the concept of session zero um, mm-hmm. is, like, sitting down together and all kind of collaborating on that. Um, but I think even in most games, like, as much as you might collaborate and, like, talk it out, it's still not a group process, mm-hmm. you know, um, which this very much is. Yeah. I, I really like the thought of the the tension of getting to that uh, gate opening phase and being at the cusp of uncovering the answer for one of your um, one of your things that'll unlock more about yourself mm-hmm. and not and having to decide having to decide to stay <gasps> and watch the world for oh, more. Man. Ryan, and then like everybody else wanting to leave, and you being like, "I need to stay because I'm so close to figuring this out." Yeah. And then, oh, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> and oh. one aspect of that is that, as the result of scenes, the phase can change on its own. Meaning, oh man, we don't have complete control about how long we have to exit this world. Oh, no. That <sighs> chance could pass us by. <sighs> This is very good. <laughs> this is very good. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, oh, yeah. Love it's very it, good. Love that's it. all I have. That's, that's hot, percolating. Hot take. <laughs> I'll come back to you with my thoughts in like 20 minutes when I sort them all out. <laughs> all right. So let's go ahead and get into our last segment, um, which is our advancement discussion that Ryan has so helpfully named, take it up a level. It's a very good one. <laughs> it's we not. need like a music still, hit for that, right? Dear listeners, I continue to be upset about this. <laughs> <laughs> take it up a level. Take it up a level. Awesome. Well, in this segment, we will cover how character advancement and growth works in the system. Um, over the course of a story, we often see characters grow and change as people within the narrative. Uh, so what 
sort of changes happen to the characters in this game, uh, aside from the, the obvious ones. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I guess we've talked about some of it, like, you're meeting these characters throughout the game, and the advancement, to some extent, is like, <laughs> now we've played four sessions and you get to learn your name. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, this this gradual uncovering of meeting yourself uh, is is going to be a big one, and also finding those those hits of like when we can really like deftly connect plot hits to things that would like you know jog your ghost memory of themselves. Um, mm. So that's a big you know a big advancement is just going to be this gradual reveal of information. Um, and I guess the, you know, this, these phases of the moon that shift the story will do that as well. Um, and then we didn't get to see it as much, but while there aren't like advancements for the in-world characters, uh, like, you know, Camden doesn't have advancements per se, there are things that as a result of scenes and troubles, you know, will impact the in-world characters. Hmm. That's really interesting. So as as a person that very notably hates having to name characters and then for some reason made a character creation podcast. <laughs> um, I was really excited that one of the things is like you discover your name and I was like, "Go. Oh, that's so good. I can wait like four right? sessions before yeah, I have to same. worry about that." Uh -huh. Or if I like pick that one last, that's why like I was I like, "Can you get the book? To. I need the book." <laughs> yeah, that's know. why it's why I keep it over here. I'm like, "I don't know." Like I already have two children i've already named them but we keep the books because i make this podcast <laughs> yeah questlandia was originally meant to be played as a one shot but we've talked about the fact that this new version can be used for campaigns um so how does like leveling up and advancement work and are there mechanical changes associated with that or is it more the narrative changes of like discovering yourself this is a part of the game that's under active development um, yeah yeah <laughs> there's a goal yes, later <laughs> for sure to make it so that as you uncover the past of your ghost as you understand your character you are also getting new tools to interact with and find out more and change more about the worlds that you're exploring uh the nature of that is to be decided but mm -hmm. the overall goal is that as you as a group are becoming comfortable with this system and comfortable with the creation of these worlds and traveling through them, your ability to use the symbol reader to create characters, to like investigate the past and future of this society, to investigate the outside world, to figure out different ways of connecting the worlds that you've been to all become added to your toolkit. I'm, I'm really excited to see where the advancement and, and where the, like, um, the, the deep campaigns can yeah. go in this sort of game. Yeah, I know that there's, like, still a lot to work on, but, like, y'all, this is real good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Amelia. <laughs> this is real good. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's great. That's really gratifying to <laughs> this hear. Was, this was, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's like, it might just be like exactly my thing. Like, I like maybe I am the niche audience. <laughs> we made you something. Can't speak for everybody. Like, look what you <laughs> we gave made me. You something very you guys, specific. Let's so <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I really like this. And I, I would love to see how it would go over time when you start building like multiple worlds mm -hmm. and knowing more about yourself as you start to interact with those worlds too is really fascinating to me. Yeah. I, I'd, also, I'd also be very curious to see if you could revisit a world after you've left it. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's one of the questions we're going to have. I mean, another question is like when your junk poet learns everything or junk poet, I'm still using, you know, <laughs> old canon. Um, when your ghost learns everything about themselves that there is to learn, do they pass on? Uh, like, you know, are they sort of released and now you pick a new junk poet, a new ghost? Ah! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll just have yeah, to have keep... you fulfilled like 
<laughs> the reason that you were like haunting, you know, like I, yeah. I think in like any kind of like ghost movie or some story, it's like, oh, they have their reason yeah. that they can't right. continue on. Like, have you solved that problem? Uh, yeah. So There's lots also the of possibility questions. of taking a beloved character from a world and elevating them to their own archetype. Oh, oh whoa, I hadn't even thought about that. Join that just blew my trials. mind. Oh my gosh. Write that down. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so good. I mean, this this yeah. discussion about the game in every play test has consistently just been like a point of fascination and like excitement for everybody. Everybody we talk mm-hmm. to is just like, what are they going to do next? How do it change? What are they going to get out of it? And so uh, <laughs> I just hope we can live up to that. Like yeah. the, the yeah. greatness <laughs> of that question. I hope we can come up mm-hmm. with an answer that is as satisfying as you'd hope. I want to ask one more question. Um, and it's not on the list, but it still kind of has to do with this segment. Um, is it like how much more difficult or less difficult, I guess, um, have you found it to try and make a game specifically that allows for campaigns versus a one shot? Like, is that like a, do you go into it with a totally different design perspective or is it just like, we need to add more options so you can continue doing things or like, how has that worked out for you? I think we're just going to be starting to answer that question soon. I mean, this is our first a campaign game that we've made and in some ways I feel like we're cheating because we're taking these worlds and like you know you could just play in a world for a session and then you could play in another world for another session but I mm-hmm. think we do want to make you know um, have options for playing in a world for many many sessions so I feel like it's a lot harder you know because there are like mechanics that you can use like in Damn the Man, Save the Music, it has these mm. really simple mechanics. There's sort of three things you can do in a scene, and then you play for a few hours. And like, those aren't mechanics I necessarily would want to see for like repeated over a game that I played for years. But for a game where you have like, you know, a half an hour to learn the rules and then play it with everybody, it works totally well. So mm. I don't know, this is a whole new challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the big challenges of a campaign game is playtesting a campaign. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dang. It's yeah. huge. Forgot entirely about that part. Uh, uh-huh. It's yeah. hard to, I mean, it's hard to get any group together for a campaign, let alone a campaign version of a game that's in production where you have to restart sometimes because the game has changed. Mm-hmm. So even if you manage to do everything and get the group together, you're like, oh, sorry, that game we were playing doesn't exist anymore. There's a new one, mm-hmm. and it needs to start from scratch. It's oh. easy to test the first part. And, like, part. to relearn the rules every time, right. too, then, if there are different rules. And... Yeah. <laughs> uh, please forget everything you knew about the previous game, or mm-hmm. we have to find new friends. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> I know. Or use that, like, little men in black memory wiper on our <laughs> existing friends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very tricky. I don't know. I think that, like, as a player, that would be very fun, though, to, like, constantly, like, sort of push at those boundaries and say, like, you know, this thing definitely worked, this thing definitely didn't. And then, um, well, and then the question, too, of, like, how much influence do the players have on what that future game looks like? Because that is also one campaign, Mm -hmm. right? So, like, this mechanic that worked super great in the story we were telling, like, does that also translate over to an entirely different game? Totally. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, years we actually playtested. The first ever playtest of Questlandia 2 was years ago, and we just kind of slapped the mechanics of the first Questlandia into a game and ran it with some of our friends. Um, And all of whom I think were game designers. And when we finished the campaign, I was like, Evan, that worked great. We are just going to have such an easy time making this game. And Evan was like, and I'm sorry to say that was just our friends. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're just like really nimble and like wonderful and enthusiastic people. And they're, 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 it's possible there's not actually a lot of a game here. Yeah, they were the kind of people that you could just be like, you know, 
let's have a scene. And they'll be like, great idea. (laughs) (laughs) It will have to do with the king's art. (laughs) <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think too with their game designers too, there's probably like some level of um sort of like a base knowledge of how yeah. games work and how mechanics work and like kind of coming into that. But you know, we talked earlier about making this a game for people who haven't really played these kinds of games before too, which adds a whole other level of like complexity to that design part and you know, trying to explain that to people who don't even really know what a role playing game is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I do not envy the task. Ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> I like you. what you have so far, yeah. but like, oh man, I'm Same. tired of thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, is there anything else uh, you want to say before we wrap things up here? Uh, listen to Design Doc. It's sort of the the strange darling of the one shot network, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's you know it's probably at this point the best way to follow the progress on the game if you liked what you heard. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I highly recommend it as well. Yeah, I'm so excited to see where this goes. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and thank, thank you, you both. both for playing. Yeah, you were our unwitting yeah. playtesters, too. It's like, yeah. <laughs> you fooled us. We don't play games I on this know. show, Hannah. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> oh, no. Awesome. Well, Evan and Hannah, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Questlandia and Questlandia 2. Uh, can you remind everyone where they can find you and... How long we might have to wait for this game? Oh, <laughs> or follow the progress follow- of the game. What a question to slip into the end! What a <laughs> dagger to pull out. Okay, so like all of the questions, how can people find you? How can they find Questlandia? How can they follow the progress of Questlandia too? <laughs> <laughs> what other things are you working on? <laughs> uh, uh, how can people find you, Evan? Um, people can find me on Twitter at a drawn novel. Um, they can find Questlandia. They can find some information on our website, which is makebigthings.com. But if they want to know everything about Questlandia 2, you should check out Design Doc on the One Shot Podcast Network, where mm-hmm. you can learn more than we remember even about the game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dig up the archives. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What about you, Hannah? If people want to find me online, I am on Twitter at HandBandit. I have a Patreon, I think also at HandBandit. And um, where else? There was something. Oh, and <laughs> in terms of when the game is going to be finished, it's we've had to swap production. This was supposed to be our next game, but we've swapped it with Starship Ultralux. Um, that's going to be coming out probably around January, but for mm-hmm. Questlandia 2, I am like trying to convince Evan and Brian that we should be sort of releasing this game digitally on Itch.io uh, in pieces and kind of continuing in the design doc spirit with, you know, this public design process. So <laughs> if I can convince them, maybe the game will be available very soon in some playable format. If not, you'll have to listen to Design Doc to find out, because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to be determined. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you again, both of you, for sitting down with us. This was so much fun. Uh, and thank you to everyone for listening. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. 
this episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also check our notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, like dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you'll find other great shows like Arms of the Tide. Arms of the Tide is an actual play about fighting for what's right in an original magic technological world on the brink of catastrophe using the Mutants in the Night system. Join Quinn, Joe, Chanel, and John and revel in the laughs and gasp at the drama while the only thing standing against the apocalypse are a robot with a fondness for stray cats, a wolf made of living plants with a bad case of depression, and a private eye who's so done with all of this. Yay. Yay. Okay, great. Yay. We did it. Okay, cool. You guys, thanks for joining us. See you later. (laughs) That's a podcast. That's as good as it's going to (laughs) get. I'm at the start of week five of uh, bronchitis. Oh, so, I'm so sorry. Um, oh. So if I cough into the microphone on accident, I apologize. How is week five comparing to the other weeks? Much better. <laughs> um, nice. Still miserable, though, because oh. I don't want to be coughing anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that stuff can just take like, forever. I know. Although it timed it perfectly to uh, probably clear up the week of a catacon. Cool, just in time to like lose your voice and re- be around con crud and everything. Oh. I know, right? I say though, I've actually never gotten con crud. Oh, I should, like, that's right. amazing. I think uh, I've never not gotten it. I so I've worked in healthcare for fifteen years. I have two small children. My mom also works in healthcare. Like my ex husband worked in a school. Like I think I'm just like immune to everything. You at have this just point. like a super uh. immune system. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, there's nothing at a con that I'm not already picking up from two small elementary school yeah. children. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> I don't think I've gotten it either. I, I use a liberal supply of hand sanitizer. Mm-hmm. It generally seems to work well. And drink a lot just of put tea. put it on tea. everybody you meet. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Just Here, if we could just, people. like, slather this all over yourself before you even talk to me, that'd be great. Let me shake your hand and your face, and let me get a little bit on your arms. <laughs> yeah, just in case. Here. Just in case. <laughs> it sounds like the time my mom was Googling whether you can Febreze a dog. <laughs> She's like, this dog smells so bad, and I cannot give her a bath till tomorrow. Like, can I use Febreze on a dog? You cannot. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> I was supposed to record, too, and I had to yeah, like, just tell my it. co-host. I was like, okay, hang on. I'll be right there. We're Googling whether you can Febreze the dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's important information. It is. These are things you need to. These are need to know facts. Whew, it's kind of warm in here, but I just had some super it's hot tea. Like so. It's song, <laughs> so I know it's it's, weird. it's not normally that warm this fast, but like I said, I just had some hot tea, so that would make sense. Are you wearing our You're podcast? Bringing shirt? steam into a sauna. It's a dangerous game. <laughs> of course, I'm wearing our podcast shirt. It's cozy and it's fashionable. You can get yours at the One Shot Podcast <laughs> store right now. <laughs> Just like this banner. Oh, that's so cool. The I banner's also, awesome. I know. I, uh, I, I know I'm going to forget this to bring to it a catacomb. Put it on the table for a panel. Oh, yeah. It'll look all official and everything. Should. Um, the image like resolution for the G5R1 wasn't like big enough to do the banner. You can do like everything else. I was kind of bummed. We make games. I'm going to just start that again. <laughs> um, uh, we make... What do, what do we do? I know. <laughs> Who are we? Now is the perfect time for an existential <laughs> crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Literally a metaphor for the play. 
literally a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> something different. It's like being right back in English class. <laughs> <laughs> you teleported me back twenty years. I'm sitting in an English class anyway. I mean, it's technically uh, true. <laughs> and now, <Hello. laughs> how's your voice holding up? Voice is fine. It's the random coughing that's oh. annoying. Whew. Just took some day cold though. So let's hope Powering that helps through. <laughs> Powering through. Oh. The show must go on. <laughs> I've been really enjoying and reacting to everything that's been happening here on mute. Oh, you've so. been on mute. Uh. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, I guess without your I was video. Like, that joke didn't land. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've decided that we all hate you during the break, and you're yeah. getting the silent treatment, so... I mean, it took me a solid <laughs> ten minutes to realize, so I don't know what that says about That's me. That's really well, you, I'm I'm ready to be a ghost. What's really funny, though, is you had this on mute, Zoom, but was your actual microphone muted? No. So oh, now... You're now... Get all this... <laughs> <laughs> Can that be bonus audio? <laughs> oh, we do outtakes, so yeah. Oh my god. That's amazing. Well, uh, thanks, future Ryan. All right, here we go. Going to count Amelia back in. Three, two, one, clicky. I did it. Yeah. Ooh. Very distinct waveform than that. Um, during the break, I was going to check on my children, but they left a note outside their door that says, caution, danger inside. So I'm going to go ahead and assume <laughs> everything's fine, uh, and they'll come get me if they need me. Oh. <laughs> it has like a little triangle with an exclamation point in it, too, so uh, it looks very serious. Oh, like a very official caution <laughs> sign. Yeah, absolutely. So I was like, you, mm, you have to, I'm going to leave that alone. Yeah. <laughs> oh. If it's that official, you have to. I mean, they're quiet, though, so, like, that's the part that's concerning to me. So, like, <laughs> something's up in there. They're probably just reading. <gasps> no, Nate already read the book that I got him on Wednesday. Uh, well, he read it he's... by the end of Wednesday. Mind you, he didn't get home from school until 6.15. Wow. But, like, 9.30 at night, he was done with the book already. Oh. Wow. I told him no more books for a little bit. I've bought four of them in the last two weeks. <laughs> He has to wait until... That's why you got to go to the library and just get a stack of them. But he rereads them. So, like... And I don't mind. They're, like, scholastic... Like, I guess. I mean, they're graphic novels. Um, but so they're, like, seven or eight bucks. I don't really care. Um, and the other kid will read them eventually. But, like, I told him he has to wait until his next book that we've pre-ordered comes. Um, but that's in, like, two weeks. So he'll be okay. He'll survive somehow. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> He's just going to be reading anything he can get his hands on now. Yeah. Yeah. That's Oh my gosh, who knows? Who knows what sort of things he could find? Christian labels. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's been reading um, Molly Ostertag's book, the Witch Boy series. Oh, and so, cute. like, the, the third one comes out, um, like, next week or week after. So he'll, he'll have to wait until then. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, my dad's, like, cleaning the garage. And so, like, he keeps opening and closing the garage door. And it, like... Just keep it open. I, I don't know. Dude, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but now it's, like, in the background of all this audio, this, like... Um. <sighs> it's easy to remove, though. It's like white, the white noise. <laughs> uh-huh. What about you, Evan? Uh, my appearance is a small garden snake. And... My manner is rough-edged and loving. Did we lose Evan? Oh, I think we lost oh. lost you for a second, Ev. Oh, are, am I back? Uh, yeah. Yes. It seems like you are, yes. That, okay. I thought you all were just like really... <laughs> oh, no. Right. Like, this is really... It's <laughs> not like we were ignoring you before <laughs> we're and just like... sending you through the ringer here. <laughs> this is just emotional turmoil. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely the wrong choice. So, uh, I'm going to stick with it. Okay. And. Sorry, now he's playing like very loud music in the garage. 
Um, and it's like all picking up on my audio, and like I'm very frustrated. Things are getting more and more exciting. Yeah. I know. You know like, it, it's like it's okay. banging things around. For a while, there was a lawnmower running. It's a oh, classic lawnmower when you're doing the podcast. Yeah, love mm-hmm. that one. Um, also, he's having back surgery in like three days, so he should not be doing <laughs> any of these things. Why? So, <laughs> Yes. I, yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 So, anyway. Well, when I make a person, they're definitely not going to be that. <laughs> I'll make sure that... <laughs> All right. Oh, my God. <laughs> now we're starting up the Mustang. Oh, it's Lord. fine. It's okay. It's fine. It's great. I'm so sorry, Ryan. <laughs> That's okay. Maybe All Evan, right, you so cut out again. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but now yeah, I'm not. You're good no, now. You're okay. good. I wonder why I'm cutting out. I just don't know. I I wonder how often that's been happening. <laughs> well, <laughs> mostly you've seen present. <laughs> I guess we'll okay. find out when we go to edit everything. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> the whole commentary. <laughs> <laughs>